Every few years, aviation delivers a paradox so strange that even industry veterans stop and stare. One of the starkest examples is the aircraft that passenger airlines rejected in frustration, regulators scrutinized for decades, and engineers have quietly described as a brilliant idea wrapped in difficult physics. In 2025, 35 years after its first flight, the MD-11 remains a critical backbone of two of the world's largest logistics networks. FedEx and UPS are flying it not as an act of nostalgia, but as a deliberate business decision made in the middle of unimaginable global supply chain pressure. But following the catastrophic crash of UPS Flight 2976 and the unprecedented grounding that came after it, a much sharper question has emerged. How did an airplane with such a troubled past become indispensable? And can it realistically stay in the sky for another decade? Let's figure out in this episode. To understand why the MD-11 still exists at all, we need to rewind to the moment of its birth. Because the aircraft's biggest problem wasn't bad engineering, it was timing. When the MD-11 was conceived in the mid-1980s, the long-haul market was still dominated by tri-jets and quad-jets. McDonnell Douglas believed that a modernized successor to the DC-10, equipped with a digital cockpit, extended fuselage, winglets, and more efficient engines, would capture the next generation of global airline demand. And on paper, this was not a naive assumption. The MD-11 entered service with performance promises that looked competitive and even forward-leaning for its era. The problem was that the industry was shifting underneath the company's feet. The aircraft entered the market just as ETOPS regulations matured, granting twin-engine aircraft permission to fly the very routes trijets once monopolized. Within a few years, the Boeing 777 and the Airbus A330 began delivering real-world efficiency, comfort, and reliability numbers far beyond what McDonnell Douglas could extract from a three-engine platform. The MD-11 wasn't outdated because it was flawed, it was outdated because it tried to solve a problem the industry was already moving away from. That mismatch created the tension that would define the aircraft's early life. Airlines complained not only about fuel, burn, and rain shortfalls, but also about the operational fragility built into the design. McDonnell Douglas had aggressively reduced tailplane size to cut drag and save weight, which improved cruise performance but created a more demanding aircraft to handle, particularly around landing and flare. The MD-11 required a level of precision that mainstream passenger airlines were not incentivized, trained, or structured to deliver consistently. And so, despite flying only a few years for some operators, the MD-11 in passenger service quickly became a victim of changing regulatory philosophy, emerging twin-engine competition, and an unfortunate aerodynamic compromise. In the passenger world, it simply arrived in the wrong decade. By the mid-1990s, the MD-11 had acquired a reputation as a jet that demanded constant respect. Pilots that transitioned from the DC-10 immediately noticed its sharper pitch response, reduced stabilizer authority, and higher landing speeds. These characteristics were not defects. They were the mathematical result of design decisions meant to improve efficiency at altitude, but they produced consequences near the runway. As investigations later showed, the aircraft had one of the highest hard landing rates among wide bodies. Its bounce dynamics where a firm touchdown could quickly evolve into a pitch oscillation cycle were particularly unforgiving. Several accidents followed a similar pattern. A bounced landing, a nose down correction, structural overload on the second impact, and a rapid wing or landing gear failure. FedEx Flight 14 in Newark and FedEx Flight 80 in Narita are the textbook examples and both accidents exposed not a flaw in construction, but a narrow margin for error created by its unique aerodynamic configuration. The MD-11 could be flown safely, but it required training that went beyond generic wide-body procedures. It demanded what test pilots often describe as active respect. This is where the story diverges sharply from passenger aviation. Cargo airlines operate differently. Their pilots fly longer sectors, experience consistent aircraft assignments, and operate within more structured nightly network rhythms. Over time, FedEx and UPS built training ecosystems around the MD-11's quirks. Specialized simulator programs emphasize bounce recovery, high sync rate avoidance, and disciplined go-around decision-making. 
By the early 2000s, both companies had developed internal safety cultures tailored to the aircraft's behavior, something passenger airlines never had time or incentive to mature. In other words, the MD-11 was not the wrong aircraft universally. It was the wrong aircraft for the wrong sector of the industry. In cargo aviation, where crews are more standardized and operational profiles more predictable, the aircraft's demanding personality was not a liability. It was a known variable that could be trained for. If the MD-11 struggled so visibly in passenger service, why did cargo operators embrace it? The first reason was economic gravity. By the time airlines abandoned the type, the frames were shockingly young. Many retired MD-11s were less than a decade old practically newborns in wide body terms. Their low acquisition cost, combined with the relatively inexpensive passenger to freighter conversions, created one of the most financially attractive opportunities in aviation. But economics alone cannot explain why FedEx and UPS committed billions of dollars to the aircraft. The deeper, more strategic reason is that the MD-11 occupies a payload range niche that is remarkably difficult to replace. It can carry roughly 90 tons of cargo, far more than a 767-300F, but without the enormous cost associated with operating a 747. For long-haul express routes, Memphis to Cologne, Louisville to Anchorage, or Cologne to Newark, that middleweight capability is exactly what a global overnight logistics network needs. And then there is fleet philosophy. FedEx inherited the world's largest DC-10 fleet, and its engineering departments, maintenance crews, and training divisions were deeply embedded in the McDonnell Douglas ecosystem. The MD-11 was not an exotic new type. It was an evolutionary step rooted in systems, engine families, and design logic the company already understood. Similar cockpit architecture meant lower training costs. Similar maintenance requirements meant existing tooling and spares could be reused. Commonality matters enormously when you operate hundreds of wide bodies across synchronized hubs every night. Even the MD-11's most criticized characteristics worked in the cargo world's favor. The very range penalty that frustrated passenger airlines became irrelevant because the longest cargo city pairs rarely exceed 4,000 nautical miles under real-world loading. And the fuel burn penalty, while unquestionably real, did not compound as aggressively in networks that prioritize payload maximization over frequency. By the mid-2010s, the MD-11 had become something rare in aviation, an aircraft that failed spectacularly in one market and achieved enduring success in another because its weaknesses aligned with someone else's strengths. That carefully balanced equation was shaken dramatically in 2025. The crash of UPS Flight 2976, in which the left engine separated from the aircraft during initial climb, was more than a tragic accident. It was an exposure of a design vulnerability that traces its lineage directly back to the DC-10 era. Preliminary findings pointing to fatigue cracks in the pylon structure struck a nerve across the industry. The FAA's emergency grounding of all MD-11s marked the first time the aircraft had been parked globally and the operational shockwaves hit FedEx and UPS at the worst possible moment in the supply chain calendar. For the first time, the economics that had prolonged the MD-11's life collided with the regulatory and public perception realities of operating an aging trijet with known structural sensitivities. FedEx had previously planned to fully retire the type by 2028, later extending the target to 2032. UPS, until recently, had no public retirement plan at all. But the grounding has forced both carriers to reevaluate not just the aircraft's maintenance intervals or inspection programs, but the broader reputational risk of continuing to rely on a jet whose design dates back nearly four decades. The MD-11 has reached a crossroads, not because it suddenly became unsafe, but because the tolerances that once made it viable have narrowed. The aircraft story is no longer just about fuel, burn, or payload. It has become a case study in how economics, regulation, training culture, and structural aging converge in the final years of a commercial airframe's life. Whether the MD-11 remains in service until 2032 or disappears far sooner depends on how those pressures interact. What is clear is that its continued existence was never an accident. It was a deliberate strategy built on extracting maximum value from a complex but capable machine. The tragedy of 2976 has not erased that logic, but it has exposed the limits of how long it can hold. That's all for today's episode. Thank you for watching. Tell me what you think in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video.